Well, shalom, my name is Todd Bennett, and I'd like to welcome you to this latest episode of the Leaving Babylon series. I'm here in Jerusalem, Israel, celebrating Sukkot, and what better place to record episode 21 than under the sukkah. Now, we've spent a lot of time in this series adjusting our paradigms, and including the way that we view our existence and the way that we understand our faith. An important part of leaving Babylon involves understanding the plan of Elohim and how we fit into that plan. Much of the world and the religions of man utterly fail to understand the covenant that's described in the scriptures, and Christianity has specifically separated itself from the covenant with Israel and attempts to create a brand new covenant separate and apart from Israel. I hope by now that you understand that to be a clear error. And of course, much of the problem is that Western Christianity has detached itself from the Eastern culture and language, and we've been discussing that throughout the series. It has also misappropriated the scriptures and, and sometimes elevates uh, letters from Paul above the clear and unequivocal words of Yahuwah, Yeshua, Moshe, and the prophets. And the words of Peter are just as true today as they were 2,000 years ago, when he wrote in 2 Peter 3.16, as also in, in his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. And the main reason why people twist Paul's writings and the scriptures, as Peter described, is typically, typically because they fail to understand how to treat the scriptures and a need to place every text and passage into its appropriate context. And we already discussed this in a previous episode entitled Understanding the Scriptures. And that is the primary focus of the Walk in the Light book entitled The Scriptures. The overwhelming thrust of the scriptures is that Yahweh is seeking a people to establish a covenant with. And through this covenant family, he would redeem and restore mankind to dwell with him in his house. The scriptures describe that covenant process through Abraham, through Isaac, and Jacob to Israel. And we read about how Israel broke the covenant and was divided into two houses. The northern tribes became known as the house of Israel, and the southern tribes became known as the house of Judah. Each of these two kingdoms fell away from Yahuwah. The northern kingdom was completely removed from the land by the Assyrians, and their exile would end up lasting 2,730 years as described by Ezekiel, and the multiplication of that uh, 390 years, according to Moses, which was seven times. The southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians and partially exiled. The good figs were exiled to Babylon, and the bad figs were allowed to stay, according to Jeremiah. Jeremiah also described that they would be allowed to return after 70 years, and that's much of the context of the book of Daniel as he was praying for the end of the 70 years so that they could return to Jerusalem and Jerusalem could be rebuilt. He was visited by Gabriel and given a timeline of 70 weeks, and we read about that in Daniel 9. This gave a timeline for the return and the rebuilding and also for the Messiah. Daniel had previously been told to seal up a vision, and we read about the unsealing by Yeshua in the book of Revelation. Now, much of the book of Revelation was meant for specific assemblies that existed while John was still alive. Some of it refers to the end, which is the culmination of the covenant through the final harvest of the planet that will occur through the appointed times. Sadly, many in Christianity have failed to interpret the prophets and Revelation in their proper context and apply many events to the future uh, and to the Christian church. And the context of most of the prophets involves the punishment upon the two houses of Israel and Yehuda, and the promise of the regathering and restoration through the Messiah. Now, when we read the prophets, we need to understand the context within which they were given. For instance, were they a prophet to the house of Israel, or were they a prophet to the house of Yehuda, or were they a prophet to Israel in general? If so, during what period of time did they prophesy? Was Israel still united or was it divided? If divided, then which kingdom were they prophesying to? Were both kingdoms still in the land? Or had one or both been sent into exile when the prophecy was given? 
Or was it after the 70 year exile when the house of Yehuda had been allowed to return to the land? You know, this is the primary reason why so many people fail to understand the prophecies in Daniel, uh, particularly the 70 week prophecy. Dan Daniel was in Babylon after Babylon had destroyed the temple and exiled many from the house of Yehuda, uh, referred to as the good figs by Jeremiah. And Daniel was one of those good figs. He knew that Jeremiah had prophesied a 70 year exile and he was praying when that exile would end. And we, again, we read about that in Daniel 9. Daniel 9, 1 through 21 provide us with context. And then Daniel 9, 22, beginning at that point and onward, we read about the visitation from Gabriel and those 70 weeks. He was given a timeline of 70 weeks by Gabriel that were fulfilled by the Messiah. He was told that in the 70th week, the covenant would be renewed and that the Messiah would be cut off. Now here is a point of prophecy that many fail to understand. They attribute the covenant to a future antichrist and they believe that there must be a seven year period of tribulation because of this 70th week and a three and a half year period of a great tribulation after a future temple has been rebuilt and the sacrifices begin and then cease once again. Now this is a grave mistake and a misunderstanding of the text. The 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled in the final week of Yeshua's life when he confirmed or better yet championed, elevated, made great a covenant for one week. Uh, this was a literal week when Yeshua came into Jerusalem as a king. He renewed the covenant at the Passover meal, often referred to as the Last Supper. Through his body and blood, he renewed that covenant, symbolized by the bread and the wine. Uh, he was cut off in the midst of the week on a Wednesday and then he was resurrected on the final day of the week, the Sabbath. So people amazingly attribute this fulfillment by the Messiah to the Antichrist at some future date. And as a result, we have countless Christians expecting a chain of events to occur in the future that already occurred in the past. And this is because they don't understand Yisrael, the covenant, and the Messiah's role in renewing the covenant provided through the appointed times. Moses and the prophets foretold that Yisrael would be punished, but that there would also be a renewal through the covenant. And Yeshua specifically came to renew that covenant. Again, the covenant was meant to draw the nations back to Yahuwah through Yisrael. And that would either be done through Israel's obedience and their blessings associated with that obedience, or it would occur through Israel's disobedience and the curses that resulted therefrom. Uh, Israel ultimately chose to obey and they were cursed and exiled. And the house of Israel was actually divorced from Yahuwah. And as a result, they needed a renewal into the covenant by marriage. And this is the context of Messiah's coming and that is the context of his return. He specifically stated that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the fulfillment of his return will involve the gathering and marriage with his flock. He came the first time to pay the penalty for that covenant being broken. And he'll return again to claim what is his, what belongs to him according to that covenant. Without that context of the past, it's really difficult to understand the future. And this is where most Christians run into trouble. Most in modern Christianity have relied on source texts of Greek and English and Western texts which describe the renewal of a covenant that originated in an Eastern culture and has been written in Eastern texts. And they've missed much from the Eastern Hebrew texts. And they've also obviously inherited all sorts of traditions that uh, involve uh, replacement theology and they believe that the Christian church is now spiritual Israel and, they, and they've replaced Israel. And so all these traditions and translation issues have made it very difficult for people to actually understand the proper context of the prophets. And as a result, many have a flawed view of history, prophecy, and ultimately the future. They often apply prophecies intended for Israel to the Christian church. And they filter the text through their inherited traditions and therefore most Christians are left with a deficient understanding of scriptural prophecy and an, an erroneous expectation of things to come. Now for instance, I grew up believing and expecting a seven year 
tribulation with a final three and a half year great tribulation. I was then given a choice of, of a pre-trib, a mid-trib, or a post-trib rapture. Uh, the seven year tribulation was so steeped in my faith that it was an assumed fact, as was the rapture, although neither of these ideas really have any support in the scriptures. I was taught to believe that the temple had to be rebuilt and sacrifices had to be resumed in order for the Antichrist to now come and stop those from occurring. And as a result, I was intrigued by the search for the Ark of the Covenant in the ashes of the Red Heifer because I wanted the temple to, re to be rebuilt so that these things could happen and the Messiah could return. And I was taught to believe that the Antichrist was going to make a seven-year covenant with the Jews and then that covenant would be broken. And all of these doctrines and beliefs are based upon inherited assumptions and traditions, not necessarily a proper reading of the scriptures. Amazingly, there are many Messianic and Hebrew roots people who espouse these same ideas because they came out of Christianity and they're so rooted in their belief system that they fail to recognize the error. And this is ultimately the problem with tradition. It often clouds the truth and that becomes our reality. And then we, we read and we sift and filter the scriptures through that reality, through that lens. And as a result, we have many people watching and waiting for the fulfillment of prophecies that have long past been fulfilled and events that are simply not going to happen at all. And the point of leaving Babylon is to shed these inherited traditions and walk in unadulterated truth so that we're found ready for the Master's return. And this involves understanding the covenant plan provided through the appointed times and the prophets. We also need to understand the purpose of prophecy. For instance, so many people look at prophecies as a way of telling the future, but that's typically not the primary purpose of a prophet. A prophet usually came to warn the people to repent, to turn, to turn back to the ways of Yah. If they strayed from the covenant, his job was to point out the error and often warn of the punishment associated with disobedience, but ultimately he was trying to get them to obey. They would also often provide encouragement if the people would repent and return. Hosea, for instance, lived out the process that would happen to the house of Israel if they continued to play the harlot. He was sent specifically to the house of Israel. He described that process that they would go through through the birth and naming of his three children that he had through the harlot uh, Gomer. Uh, each child was named progressively to show that uh, they would not be his people, he would not be their Elohim, and basically he would sever all relationships with the house of Israel. But ultimately, the prophecy ended with a promise that they would be regathered and be called the sons of the living Elohim. So the point is that the house of Israel would be punished, but they would also be restored. Now, clearly, some prophets provide for future events, and right now, those of us who believe in the Messiah are looking forward to his return at the end of the age. And it's important to understand that time is segmented into ages, and as many look to the future, they're anticipating the end, but the end of the age is not necessarily the end of all time or the end of creation. We're currently living in a time when many sense that we're at the end of the age, and as such, people are looking to prophecies for clues, for signs and indicators to help them better understand the times. But the, the point really is, that if we sense we're at the end of the age, then we should really be <laughs> repenting and pressing in and making sure that we're ready for the culmination of the end of the age. I was raised in an evangelical Christian setting that tended to apply a future fulfillment to most prophecies, and as a result, I would have been classified as a futurist. As I began to study the scriptures and look at their historical context, I realized that many prophecies were given at specific times, and in specific contexts, and had actually already been fulfilled in the past. And those who believe that prophecies were fulfilled in the past are often classified as preterists. And I discuss this issue in detail in my book, uh, The Final Shofar. And it's, it is, it's extremely important that people looking for answers in the scriptural text understand this distinction. Now the problem with labels is that they tend to pigeonhole people into different categories. While some people are strictly futurists and others are strictly preterists, I happen to believe that there's room in the middle. Clearly there are prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past, 
but there are also certain prophecies that remain unfulfilled. Therefore, when reading the scriptures, and particularly prophecies, we should always be aware of the time in history that they were written, the context in which they were given, as well as the person speaking the word and to whom it was spoken, and whether the events being described actually happened yet or not. And we know that through an examination of history. We also need to consider any translation issues concerning the passage. I recently heard a Christian commentator quote a prophetic passage regarding the day of the Lord. He proceeded to state with certainty that because the prophecy mentioned the day of the Lord, then it was clearly referring to the second coming of Jesus. Now, this is a mistake that many people make. First of all, the day of the Lord is better named, known as the day of Yahweh. And second, while well, the return of the Messiah, Yeshua, may, in, may indeed coincide with a day of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord is not specifically one future event in time. Rather, it typically describes a time when prophecy is fulfilled, and that often involves judgment. Uh, there have been many Day of Yahweh events in the past. For example, some believe that events described in Amos 5 may be one of the earliest references to the Day of Yahweh. And we know from Amos 1 that the prophecy was given at a time when Israel was divided into two kingdoms after the death of Solomon. The prophecy begins by stating, Concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. We read that in Amos 1.1. The text in Amos 5 later describes the day of Yahweh, and it specifically addresses the northern kingdom. In Amos 5.1 it says, Hear this word which I take up against you, O lamentation, O house of Israel. So the day of Yahweh spoken of by Amos involved the judgment that would befall the house of Israel by the Assyrians, and it was specifically given to the northern tribes. Other prophets would prophesy concerning the destruction that would befall the house of Judah, the southern kingdom. Now that judgment and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians was also considered to be a day of Yahweh event, and we read that in Lamentations 2.21. The subsequent fall of Babylon by the Persians was described as the day of Yahuwah by Isaiah. In what certainly sounds like an end of the world event, and you can read about that in Isaiah 13. And from these few examples, we see that it's important to understand the historical context of the prophecies and recognize that they were accomplished in the past. And just because it mentions the day of Yahuwah does not automatically mean it's a future event. And while we can learn about a future day of Yahuwah from these passages, they clearly had a previous fulfillment. Another good example of contextual and translation analysis can be found in the book of Zephaniah, which has no less than five specific references to the day of Yahuwah. And let's read the first three verses of Zephaniah in the New International Version, which sets the stage for the rest of the text. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Zephaniah 1, 1 through 3. Now, according to this text, it initially appears that we're reading about a final judgment when all things living are destroyed from the entire earth. Now, if we look at the context of the prophecy, we know that it's given during the reign of King Josiah, king of Judah. From this portion of the text, we know that his father was Ammon. And from the book of Kings, we learn Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkath, and that's 2 Kings 22.1. As a result, we can discern that he reigned from around 640 BCE to 609 or 608 BCE. And we get that from 2 Chronicles 34 and 2 Chronicles 35. Therefore, when the prophecy was given, 
The house of Israel had already seen their day of Yahweh event that had been prophesied by Amos. That judgment culminated around 722 BCE when Samaria, the capital of the house of Israel, fell to the Assyrians. So the context of the Zephaniah prophecy was after the fall of the northern kingdom, and it was given prior to the fall of the southern kingdom, the house of Judah, when Jerusalem was subsequently destroyed by the Babylonians. Now despite that context, the text still seems to be talking about a judgment upon the entire world uh, until we examine the translation. Now if we look at the word translated as world in Hebrew, we see that it's Adamah which can mean ground or land. Later we read the word Eretz is used, which also refers to land. So the prophecy is clearly talking about the land of Judah and the surrounding region. When you read further, this becomes very evident. And so it's a very specific prophecy to the royal family of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the kingdom of Judah, and the neighboring peoples. So Zephaniah is not talking about a future event or the end of the world, but rather the day of Yahweh, which was a past judgment rendered upon the land of Judah. The point of all this is that we must carefully examine the texts when we look to the future. And many people have misplaced expectations concerning the return of the Messiah because they've inherited poor eschatological teachings. And they're expecting certain events to occur that have already happened long ago, and as such, many may be found unprepared or caught off guard when the day of Yahuwah actually arrives as a thief in the night in the future. Now, Peter described the future day of Yahuwah as follows, uh, But the day of Yahuwah will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 2 Peter 3.10. Apparently, many will be unprepared because they will be sleeping. Uh, the Messiah described his future return when he spoke the parable of the ten virgins, and we read about that in Matthew 25. They all slumbered and slept, and then they were awakened by a midnight cry. Only half of them were prepared for the wedding. And now is the time to get ready and stay alert, especially those looking for signs. Uh, if you do ex see signs coming and you do expect an imminent return, then you need to make sure you've got oil in your lamp and you need to be ready for his return. But many are actually sleeping and slumbering because they're, they erroneously believe that certain events must occur before we, we begin a seven-year countdown or a three-and-a-half-year countdown, but their ex expectations may be misplaced. And In fact, I find that many have completely misunderstood the context of Matthew 24, and that's uh, some of the reason for their complacency. They believe that all the warnings given by Yeshua during the Olivet Discourse are meant for a future when most, if not all, were intended for his disciples and that generation. Now the problem is that many fail to understand history and the day of Yahweh, as I just described. After Judah had received their judgment through the day of Yahuwah, when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, they were allowed to return 70 years later. Despite being back in the land, they became divided and corrupted once again. Most importantly, most of them rejected the Messiah when he actually appeared to them, according to the timeline given to Daniel. As a result, they would be judged again. And this is the context of Matthew 24, when Yeshua left the temple and foretold of its destruction. Now, he'd already previously wept over Jerusalem because he knew judgment was coming upon her. And we read about that in Luke 19, 41 to 44. It says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And in that passage, he was describing the future attack and destruction by the Romans in 70 CE. Now, in Matthew 24, we read something similar, beginning in Matthew 24, 1, it says, Then Yeshua went out. He had been in the temple. Now he goes out, and he departed from the temple, 
and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. They, they don't know why he's leaving. They expected him to come in, clean the temple, and rule and reign as King Messiah. He's leaving, and they're pointing to him. Hey, look at the temple. And he says, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So and then he went up onto the Mount of Olives, which was directly across from the entire temple complex. Now while sitting there, staring at the temple that he, he just said would be destroyed, his disciples came to him with three questions. Uh, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. So Matthew 24 has three questions, and when you read the following passage in Matthew 24, you've got to ask yourself, which one of these questions was Yeshua answering? And when you compare the context of Luke 21, which took place earlier in the temple and dealt exclusively with two questions, it helps you to kind of parse out Matthew 24. The two questions asked in, in Luke 21 are, Teacher, but when will these things be, and what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? So Yeshua was in the temple when he said that it was going to be destroyed, and they asked him two questions specifically referring to the timing, uh, when will it happen, and what will the sign be when this is all going to happen to Jerusalem. So now, if you pit Matthew 24 and Luke 21 together, you can look at what uh, answer to what question was provided in Matthew 24 and then you can figure out what's left what's he talking about as far as the end of the age and and, um, and his coming so we can ultimately figure out what statements apply to the destruction of the temple in 70 CE and what applies to the end of the age now many when they read Matthew 24 because they read what appears to be a lot of apocalyptic language uh, they think it all happens in the future because of the assumption that the things described it can only be future events. And what they fail to understand is that some of that apocalyptic language was used in the past to describe the day of Yah, the, the, the judgment on certain kingdoms or empires. And in this context, Yeshua was using uh, very strong language to apply to the judgment and the end of the house of Yehuda. Here's what he said in Matthew 24 and 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now many people, again, because of their assumptions about the great tribulation, automatically assume that Yeshua is talking about a future tribulation uh, for us, his people, or Christians, and and uh, when he's actually referring to a future tribulation upon the house of Judah and Jerusalem that would happen some, you know, 40 years or less after he made that statement. When we place the focus on the judgment of Jerusalem, we see that this is the same type of language and terminology used uh, by Isaiah when he was prophesying about the fall of Babylon to the Medes in 539 BCE. Uh, Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 13, 9 through 10, Behold, the day of Yahweh is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth with their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Now this is language similar to, to prophecies concerning the destruction of other kingdoms, such as Samaria by Amos, that we read about in Amos 8 9, and, and the, the destruction and judgment of Egypt by uh, Ezekiel in Ezekiel 32 7 through 8. We also see similar language in Joel 2 concerning the day of Yahweh uh, as judgment brought about through conquering armies. So, this language was meant to describe the judgment that was going to befall Judah in 70 CE after the tribulation that occurred during that siege and destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Uh, that's why Yeshua had recently cursed the fig tree, representing the house of Judah, because they had failed to bear fruit, and therefore he was going to have them cut down. Yeshua was not describing some future event for all of us in this particular passage. 
And everything prior to Matthew 24, 37 is in response to the question concerning the temple. And it's the same as we read in Luke 21, 5 through 36, which dealt exclusively with the temple. So we obviously don't have time to analyze uh, all the prophetic texts, but I hope that this has given you some guidance and advice to make your study of prophecy more accurate. Uh, we have other teachings available that further describe these issues. And of course, for an in-depth analysis of prophecy in the end of the age, I recommend the Walk in the Light series entitled The Final Shofar. The important thing to keep in mind is to realize that the scriptures are focused on the covenant assembly, and most prophecies must be read within that context. In the next and final episode, we'll discuss the fulfillment of the covenant which is actually the culmination of all prophecy. Until next time, my name is Todd Bennett. Shalom.